Good evening. Yeah, I wish my wife was here to have heard that. And, is, this, is this being taped? This is great. Hi, Ryan. Um, well, welcome. And uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, I'd just like to acknowledge the hard work of the uh, faculty and the staff of uh, not only um, the group over at the seminary, yeah, but also the Howard Dayton School of Business. Uh, we have a great faculty in the university, and um, I can always speak to that group, right? I don't work with the seminary faculty, but uh, the faculty at the Howard Dayton School of Business. And um, just I love the way in which our faculty think deeply about the areas of business, but also it's, it's founded on the foundation of, of a liberal arts education. Um, you may have noticed in the news that um, our society has been somewhat fragmented uh, the last uh, 72 hours. Um, it may have been fragmented longer than that, um, but it seems to have uh, come to the forefront the last 72 hours in a, in a new, uh, fresh way. I'm reminded of what Art Holmes said about uh, a really good Christian college and a really good Christian university in terms of how they address the liberal arts, and that is that it's not uh, a promiscuous, uh, taking a promiscuous variety of courses in which a person has a smattering of courses but doesn't understand really the unity of truth. And so with the, with, if we're not careful, we, pr we, we uh, produce fragmented people, not whole people. And we live provincial lives. We live culturally provincial, provincial lives, which portrays American life as the only way. And if we're not careful, we, we, we train students to be vocationally provincial. And so the, the focus is on the job, but not really about the meaning of work, a vocational aspect and a vocational approach to the value and the meaning of work. And I think what we do tonight and what you're doing the next couple of days, the whole Asbury Project, bringing together not only the, the expertise of business, but also a theological and reflective component to that work becomes so important. And what's the goal? It's not just about money. It's not just about innovation, but it's about impact as well. And not impact just locally, but impact globally. Wesley said that all the world was his parish. And so we have a, we have a wide-ranging opportunity uh, to impact because the Lord has opened up many doors. And so I love the partnership between Asbury Seminary and Asbury University and the fact that we can work together. And so let's pray, and we'll have our meal served. Father, it's, it's as we look at your son that we realize that even though we live fragmented lives and awesome, often we experience life in fragmented pieces with some darkness here and some light there. But as we look at Jesus, we really see what wholeness is. We, some, we see not only the, the perfect image of humanity, but we also see the perfect image of God. And as we interact with each other around the table and, and throughout these next few days, we, we see fragments of that image and that wholeness in the lives of the people that we get to rub shoulders with and our brothers and sisters in Christ. And it, it really beckons within us a desire to experience the wholeness that will one day be ours when we see you. And so, Father, bless the conversation around the table. Bless this food, which is so freely and so abundantly available in this country. There are so many people around the world who wake up wondering if they'll eat. And we get to wake up merely wondering what we'll eat. So use this food to give us energy to be about your business. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. It is, uh, it is really a privilege to be here. And I, I remember back when Kevin contacted me, I don't know, seven, eight, nine months ago to be here. And I, you know, often you look, in the, you look at those dates and you say, oh, what, November 1, 9, 10. I'm like, oh, that's, let me look on the calendar. And I looked and I thought, oh, two days after the election. Hmm, that should be interesting. And uh, let's just say I had no idea. No idea would be. And here's what I want to say. The election is over. I don't want your vote. 
I'm not going to say anything bad about anybody tonight. Even you, Chris. I know things about you that I could say. I know things I could say, but I'm not going to say them. I'm not going to ask for any money. But what I am going to do is talk about what it means to be a citizen in the realities of our new world. And it is a new world. There's two songs that have been going through my mind since yesterday morning. One really old and the other a little bit newer. There's an old movie, 1972, The Poseidon Adventure. The Poseidon Adventure is a story of a cruise ship that flips over. A 90-foot wave hits the cruise ship. The ship flips over upside down. One of the lead actors in the movie is Gene Hackman as a priest. And he leads them to the top of the boat. The theme song of the film was, Could It Be the Morning After? Did we make it through the night? We have a chance to find the sunshine. Let's keep looking for the light. That's the old song. The new song is one from Josh, uh, Josh Dunn and Joseph Tyler. 21 Pilots. Tyler Joseph, not Joseph Tyler. Tyler Joseph. 21 Pilots. Wish we could turn back time to the good old days when our mama sang us to sleep, but now it's too soon. And they go on. We're all stressed out. And I think in those two songs, we're dealing with some of the reality of our time. Your candidate won. Your candidate lost. And you're not sure what to do. For the follower of Christ, there is always opportunity to contribute and make a positive difference in the world. It does not matter if the market is up. It does not matter if the market is down. It doesn't matter if a Republican, a Democrat, or an Independent, or somebody else won. The followers of Christ can make a difference regardless of the situation in our world regardless of the situation. It doesn't matter. You remember the song when you were a kid? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. What's the next verse? Hide it under a bushel. No! I'm going to let it shine. You want to know the real problem of songs like that from Sunday school? They actually had real theology in it. Hide it under a bushel. No. I'm going to let it shine. We're going to get a chance to do that song. We're going to get a chance to do that song over these next number of years. I don't know about you, but I actually wanted that just to be a song. I, I want, there's times I want to run. There's times that I want to hide. There's times that I want to go away. But that's not the reality. I remember <clears throat> when we started the Exploration Group. The year was 2008. And I had been, uh, you know, things like this stop. I, I start after something else has happened. So I, I was with a startup firm in uh, Philadelphia. And it was one of those opportunities that I knew that I just needed to do it. When I was offered the opportunity, I knew it was a high-risk high situation. And I said, I need to be a part of this. And so we moved our family, moved from Chicago to Philadelphia. And five years later, it turned out it was a high-risk move. <laughs> you know, they, they, I watched the organization go from 40 people to 200, and then I was a part of it going back to 40 again, except I wasn't in the 40 that was still there. And so it ended. And I remember that summer... I had been offered a couple of contracts and was working on some projects. And my wife and I, we were on our vacation. We were up in northern Michigan on a small lake in northern Michigan. And we were out in an inflatable boat. And we were out in the middle of the lake. And I said, honey, I've got an idea. And I started outlining the concept of what is now the exploration group. And I still remember what she said to me as we were out floating in this little boat. She said, honey... 
that's a great idea. Why don't you get a stable job until the kids get through college? And I said to her, honey, I think this is a stable job. And then I remember thinking to myself, I hope she doesn't ask me, why do you think it's a stable job? <laughs> because I didn't know. I just had a hunch. I mean, when I said, I couldn't articulate it. I just, had, in my gut, I knew it was the right thing to do. Nine years, 46 expeditions, three kids through college, our family supported, other people supported that have worked with us in the business. I'm grateful. It was a good idea, but it took a, it took a step of faith. This afternoon, I talked about crossing the crossroads. It was definitely a step of a crossroads. For those of you who were in the session this afternoon, I said, when it's business as usual, you can replicate. You can manage. You can do what has been done in the past. When there are big problems and big opportunities, it's time to explore. Management is a tool for replication. Its guiding premise is control. It's about replicating what worked before. Exploration is the tool for innovation. Its guiding premise is discovery. I think we are living, and frankly, prior to the election, we're living in times that are ripe for exploration. The old ideas aren't working like they once did. And the mood for a lot of people today is that we are now living in the morning after and not seeing what is yet, and they are indeed all stressed out. Chaos, unknown, fear, feeling like it is time to hide. That's what a lot of folks are experiencing. So I understand, you know, in, in talking to uh, several of you today, obviously this is a crowd of business people or inclinations toward business. What do business people do? They analyze markets. They analyze markets. And you know what? When I say that there's chaos and fear and unknown and we're not sure what to do, what is that? That's opportunity. That is opportunity. You say, well, people don't know what to do. Remember, a good friend of mine said, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Right now, a lot of people are blind. And who can see and start seeing will help guide the way forward. I think what I see is that it is time for what I would call the Babylonian entrepreneurs to appear. The Babylonian entrepreneurs. It's a new day. It is pregnant with opportunity for businesses that will seize it. It's a time of the person for faith to move forward with confidence. It is time to create. What is needed in the world right now? People of integrity. People who speak truth. Discernment. The sons of Issachar. Who are discerning the times and are responding. That is needed more than ever. And I believe that institutions like Asbury, people of faith, can step in and fill that void. In our time together this evening, there are four opportunities that I want for us to consider. The first one is this. There is a bigger world. We need to live in it. There is a bigger world. We need to leave in it, to live in it. This afternoon, I shared a quote from this book by Elizabeth Libert, The Way of Discernment. And she says, if you can't imagine any other world than we presently inhabit, we will not desire more. To move toward deeper desires, then we must school our imagination and learn to imagine that which is not yet. A very good friend of mine, St Stephen Grable. Some of you know Stephen Grable. Stephen and I were talking about six, eight weeks ago on the phone. And he said, Dwight, I've come to a realization on something. He said, the, there is another world and he said, if we believe in God, if we believe in heaven, if we believe there is something that happens when we pray, that means there is another world out there 
beyond the world that we see every day. He said, furthermore, that world is eternal. That world is eternal. It is not a temporal world. Therefore, the world that we do not see is actually more real than the world that we do see. And I said, whoa, Stephen, it's pretty deep for a phone call. He goes, Dwight, the world that we do not see is more real. It's more eternal than the world that we see. He says, if that is true, and he says, we believe it is, if that is true, we are playing on a whole different playing field than people who only see the here and now. And so when it comes to us as business people, when it comes to us as people of faith, we have access to that world that is beyond this one. So when it comes to our prayers, when it comes to the guidance of the Holy Spirit, when it comes to the potential advisors that you have at your access of calling on God for help, Lord, give me wisdom. Give me discernment. I've I spent most of my reading over this last year. I'm reading books all pre-1900. And the reason that I'm reading those books is that when you look at the explorers, when you look at the missionaries, you look at the people pre-1900, they lived in a world where they knew they didn't know everything. They knew that they didn't know everything. They knew there were things that they didn't know. Today, we live in a world where it's very difficult to admit that there are things that we don't know. It's, it's become politically correct. I don't know what to do. When was the last time you ever, I, I, I thought this a few years ago, I thought it with President Obama, I thought it with uh, President Bush before him. There were a couple of times where I wish they would have said, you know what, I don't know what to do. Um, Zachary Taylor, president in the 1800s, 1850-something, early 1850s, there was a cholera epidemic in this country. And in July of that year, President Taylor called for a national day of fasting, prayer, and humiliation. And in that day, there was, because of the cholera epidemic, they called unto God. And if you look this up, it turns out there were like 10 or 15 of these days that were happening in the... Uh, oh, this is what you get for not turning your cell phone on silent there. Sorry, Will, later. Um, when it comes to what they did, they recognized that they needed to reach beyond themselves. They needed to reach beyond themselves. And when they did that, and you look at the proclamation, they were calling on God because they didn't have, they were called in this other world. I have a hard time imagining that happening today. Frankly, I have a hard time having, having that, imagining that in any country. We have the opportunity to live in a bigger world. And so, opportunity to one, live in a bigger world. Opportunity Number two, create and discover. Create and discover. Make products that are desired and indispensable. We live, uh, live outside of Philadelphia. <clears throat> and the next county over from us is Lancaster County. You know, you know that. Chris is old stopping grounds. There's a town, a small town out in Lancaster County, and there's a meat market in this town. It's actually a pretty sizable little meat market. Stolfus Meats. You work there? Okay. Look at you. Look at you. Okay. So, Stolfus Meats. You probably tell this story better than I do. So, so, we would go out there and buy ham. They have got the most mm, good ham. I got to tell you. It's just good. It just tastes fabulous. And I was at a situation, I was at a meeting one time, and met Mr. Stolfus, the guy who owns it. And I said, man, we love your ham. We drive out and buy ham just because we like it so much. And I said, what's the secret? What's the secret of your ham? Like, what do you do? And I was thinking, oh, I'm going to get kind of the secret, you know, old family recipe. And he said, Dwight, I recognize that when our hams are served, families are coming together. They're sitting around the table at celebrations. Maybe Easter, maybe Christmas, maybe a special family gathering. And he says, our ham is sitting in the middle of the table. What our secret is, is that we bake a celebration into every ham. We bake a celebration into every ham. Yeah. 
the man of faith, baking a celebration in every ham. He says, because I don't want my ham to take away from that family gathering. There's a celebration in every one. About five years ago, I was in Grand Rapids. Joe Jupe is a furniture maker in, uh, in Grand Rapids. Does amazing modern design of furniture. And I, I got a strain you know, in the world of connections. I met him through a, a commission that I was on in Morocco. I was in Casablanca, Morocco. And when someone found out I had connections to Michigan, they said, oh, you need to meet this guy in Grand Rapids. So I went to Morocco to meet a guy, you know, literally right around the corner. And so I went to Joe's plant where they made furniture. Amazing modern style furniture. And Joe took me around you know, to see the woodworking and the things that they were doing, incredible veneers and finishes. It was just simply amazing. As we got through the plant, I said, Joe, your furniture is beautiful. What's the secret? He said, Dwight, I make honest furniture. I said, what do you mean? He said, I make honest furniture. He said, if it's hardwood, it's hardwood. If it's a 90 degree angle, it's not an 87, it's not an 88, it's not an 80, it's a 90 degree angle. He said, if I say there's hardwood in this, there's hardwood in what you see and there's hardwood in what you don't see. He said, I make honest furniture. And when I have something come out of here, it's honest. Psalm 24 says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Then in 2 Peter 1.3, it says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us for his own glory and goodness. Could it be that all that we need for life is right around us, but we haven't seen it yet? We haven't discovered it yet? Maybe. Maybe. Just maybe. And again, this is where exploration comes in. What if the power to solve cancer is in this carnation? And when God said in Scripture, I have given you everything for life, there are things that are right in front of our faces that we've never seen as far as its full, full potential. God is saying, I've given you everything for life. And then Dwight Gibson paraphrase, why don't they see it? Why don't they see it? I think that there is opportunities. It may be a cure for cancer. Maybe the church has a cure for poverty. Maybe God is saying, where are the explorers that are discovering for my glory in this world? Dwight Gibson paraphrase. He says, I told them to go forth and multiply. They thought it was only about making more kids. Maybe they were supposed to discover more in the world. Why don't they see it? For you, it may be a new form of a restaurant, a bank that serves in a new way, some technology that is not yet developed yet, or a whole new industry that is awaiting its founder. A whole new industry that's awaiting its founder. So opportunity number two. Create and discover products that are desired and indispensable. Opportunity number three. Be creative. Create beauty. I, I was recently with a friend. <clears throat> and... Uh, was catching up on his, his daughter. He's got a couple of kids. And, and one of his, his daughters is thinking about, is kind of age, thinking about post high school. And I said, hey, so what's, uh, and I said her name, what is she thinking about? Well, she's thinking about going to design school. And I said, really? That's fabulous. You know, what's, the, what's the story on that? And he said, well, you know, her sister, and he met, mentioned the other sister, he said, she, you know, with her disability, um, she wants to go to design school because throughout their whole life, when they go to buy shoes for her sister, when we're in the shoe store, she asked the older sister to try on the beautiful shoes because she wants to see what a beautiful shoe looks like on someone's feet because she will never be able to wear beautiful shoes. 
the shoes that are made for disabled people are not that beautiful. For if you have an atypical foot, it's hard to get a beautiful shoe. And he said, she wants to go to design school so she can create beautiful shoes for her sister. I was like, yeah, that's fabulous. To which he said, I don't know. I want her to get a good job. I chewed him out. I, I said, what do you mean? That is an amazing job. That is, and he said, he feels like it's kind of, she feels like it's a calling. I said, and you want her to get a good job and deny a calling? We have sucked the mystery and the beauty out of the world and wonder why no one is interested in what we have to say as people of faith. As business people, make beautiful products, create inspiring buildings, and provide service that has people coming back for more. Last night, I had kind of one of these strange serendipity opportunities. Someone had suggested to me that I needed to go to Marksbury Farm down here. And so I stopped in there last night to try some of the food. Well, it turns out there was a class from the University of Kentucky that was there. One of the owners was, teaches a class. And I ended up doing a tour of the whole Marksbury Farm operation, kind of the behind-the-scenes thing, which was quite amazing. And as I listened to what they did when I saw the products, when I heard about it, I heard people who say, we want to create something wonderful, something sustainable with food, something that makes a difference. That, I think, is our calling. Think about all the ugly church pole barn buildings that we have turned into churches. Ugly. I, I, I saw, candidly, I saw one yesterday as I was driving from Louisville. I thought, ooh, hope no one goes to that church from Asbury. And we say, why, you know, why aren't people coming to our churches? Look at, look at some of them. They're ugly. They're practical. They work, but we've taken away the mystery. We've taken away the beauty. We've done something that basically God has created a beautiful world to inspire us and we've returned the favor with practicality. Isn't that kind of strange? I'm not saying don't be wise. I'm not saying don't be you know, prudent. But there's opportunities for us to create beauty. We, as the followers of Christ, understand the bigger picture. We understand the beauty of a great God. Let's give that gift back to God. Here's my point. God created a beautiful world. Why should we consciously seek to create less? Opportunity three. Be creative, create beauty. Opportunity number four. Walk through the desert. Walk through the desert. Uh, there's a devotional guide, Streams in the Desert. Any, how many of you are familiar with that? Okay, a bunch of you. I, I, um, I've known of it for years, and frankly, I didn't get it. Streams in the Desert. What is that? Streams in the Desert. That makes, who would come up with that name? And I, what I kind of realized, I've just actually had a, never had a time horrible enough in my life to understand it. Streams in the desert. You're out in the desert. It's alone. Uh, I, I need you, you. You gave me a little bit too much credit, Jay. I actually haven't run the whole 135 miles. I crewed somebody else who did it, but I, I was willing to take it. I, I, I was sitting here consciously. Should I actually correct what he said? Because it felt kind of good to actually have done it. But uh, I've I've crewed it four different times. Keith Straw is the runner, and he he's just an amazing runner. And and we're out in Death Valley. It's in July, 120 plus degrees. And when you're out in the desert, it is still, it is quiet. Sometimes there's wind, sometimes there's no wind. When we're there, it's hot in the middle of the night, and it's hot in the middle of the day. It's just hot. One of the things you run, you do your best to run on the, um, the paint line on the side of the road because that's like 10 degrees 
cooler. It's like only 120 versus the other stuff that's like 130. And they, they have situations where tennis shoes, or running shoes end up melting. But as I've been out there in the desert different times, I never understood this. And what streams in the desert seeks to bring alive is the point, even in the difficult times, even in the horrible times, there are streams in the desert. And there's, God is there. Someday, in your career, you'll be in the desert. It's going to happen. For, for the exploration group, we've had really great years. We've had difficult years. Frankly, this year has been one of the difficult years. It's been a little bit harder. And I, Lord, what are you doing? What is going on here? Last year was actually a pretty amazing year. This year, wait, what's going on here? And it was in the midst of this year that I began realizing that it's in the desert that you discover the oasis. You become sensitive. You become aware. And in those times, you find out not so much what's all going on out there, but what's going on in here. Where is my hope? Where, where is this all going? Andy Crouch. So Andy Crouch wrote a book, Strong and Weak. It came out, I think, earlier this week, earlier this year. It's a book on authority and vulnerability. And I got the opportunity to read it last week. I was um, referred to today. I had this unexpected retina detachment, which gave me the opportunity to lay with my head down for 72 hours. And you get a chance to do a lot of pondering, a lot of thinking, a lot of praying. And, and I got to read several books. And, uh, and so I read Andy's book. And in that book, he talks about the role of authority and vulnerability. And by the way, in case you're envious, I don't recommend sitting for your head 72 hours. It's not, it's not something that I would kind of highly recommend. But Andy makes the case that we need to experience both authority and vulnerability in order to lead. Experiencing the desert times in our lives and then finding an oasis makes us vulnerable and dependent on God and giving us authority as we persevere and then thrive in the midst of all the chaos around us. Who are our models for living in the chaos of today? I think it's people who have lived and thrived in difficult times independence on God. For the last number of weeks, I have not been able to stop reading Daniel, Joseph, Esther, and now Nehemiah. Nehemiah, I think, is kind of the original Babylonian entrepreneur. He had a position as the cupbearer to the king. He saw a need. Again, probably not the best exegesis to build a wall <laughs> right now in our context of our country. But he saw a need to get something done, and then he deployed the resources to get the job done. He was an entrepreneur. In each case, these were people that were tested. They acknowledged God's presence, and they used their skills and their abilities. As you look at each one of these people, they were in difficult times. They were in difficult situations. They were in foreign lands. They were a place that they didn't want to be, and they said, how can we make the best? How can we do what it means to make a difference in this place and to do it in honoring God? And what is interesting is you look through all of these. When I talk about kind of this other world, they all acknowledged something beyond themselves. And what was more interesting to me even than that, because I get that, they can acknowledge something beyond themselves, they were accepted and appreciated for their skills in that place. They created something that was desired. Look at Daniel. Daniel served under three different governments as a foreigner in a hostile country. And he was appreciated and accepted. He offered and gave something. He was a wise person functioning in the palace of the king. They all stood strong in their faith in difficult times. That sounds like the kind of people that I want to have mentor me. So what does that mean for our studies? What does that mean for your calling? What does it mean for the businesses that someday you may create? It means to do your best. It means to create, discover, have no fear. Have no fear. Persevere and explore. And do it with confidence. We can do it with confidence in the midst of the unknown days in which we are living. Back to 21 pilots. 
Band names always fascinate me. I, I did uh, one of the expeditions we did with the band Jars of Clay, and I've interacted with lots of different musicians. 21 Pilots. I thought, man, how do you come up with the name 21 Pilots? And so I started doing some digging. Um, Tyler Joseph, the lead singer, when he was uh, doing some studies, he studied the play All My Sons by Arthur Miller. And it's the story of a of man who must decide what is best for his family after causing the death of 21 pilots during World War II because he knowingly sent faulty parts to the war effort for the good of his business. And then he had to live with the consequences of that. And Tyler thought that story of moral dilemma was an important story, and he wanted that to be the inspiration for 21 Pilots. Turns out, that was not a fictional play. It's based on a true story from World War II, Wright Aeronautical Air Company up the road here in Ohio. A couple of people decided, they realized they had faulty parts. They weren't passing the in inspection, and so they figured out a way to get them through. And so ended up, there was, uh, before it was Harry Truman was president, there were, uh, he was heading up some Senate committees and there was uh, presentations before this committee and, and several uh, leaders in the military lost their jobs because they had compromised, on, um, compromised under oath and sent these parts. And so in Arthur Miller's play, while the business benefited, 21 men paid the price for that compromise with their lives. So I found myself thinking over these last weeks, in this time of chaos, this time of fear, and in this time of uncertainty, we are not to compromise our beliefs, nor are we to run and hide. We are not to create a parallel Christian universe and disappear. We are not to become isolated and feel safe. I think that would be the wrong response. There are people who will die if we, as followers, choose the escapist option. There are people who will die if we, as the followers of Christ, take the escapist option. Now is the time for the followers of Christ to be creative. This is a time to create great products. It is a time to explore it is a t time to be grounded in our faith, and it is a time to start that which is needed in the world, but it has not yet been created. As followers of Christ, dependent on Christ, we can explore and we can thrive and flourish in a crazy world because there's another world where we've got that as a resource to help us as we live in this world. Thank you. Wow. Dwight, thank you so much. Uh, special thanks to uh, Dwight and Chris <clears throat> for their presentations already. And we're looking forward to another day of what they have to say and share with us. I know I, for one, take uh, a significant amount of comfort, uh, excitement, inspiration, um, and there is much to ponder, but this certainly is a time to explore. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you for those great words. May I offer one other thing? We've had uh, so many people working uh, to put the Asbury Project together, uh, really for about almost a year. Uh, certainly it's a 10-month process. But if I could just give special thanks to Deanna Spengler and Cindy Dean. Could you all stand up briefly, please? Uh, thank you. If the logistics work really well, and they, they will and they do, uh, they're behind it. If they don't, it's probably something that I did. So... Um, Let's, uh, before we conclude in prayer, tomorrow we will start back up at 10 a.m. This will be our chapel here at our campus here at Asbury University, and then our events will flow all the way through dinner uh, tomorrow evening. So we're very excited about that day. Thank you for your attention thus far today. We'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow, and let's close in prayer. 
Heavenly Father, thank You uh, for these words of wisdom. Thank You, Lord, for the picture of an alternate reality and perhaps a reality that's far more real than what's already in front of us right now. And Father, I pray that this is the reality that we would set our eyes to, uh, that we would strive towards, and that we would live within. God, I thank You again for this event, for this opportunity, for all of these different thoughts that are coming together, for the people that come together, Lord. And I pray that it would not be in vain. Lord, I pray that this would animate what we do from here and that we would find You as a motivator. But Lord, we would find Your presence as well uh, to be with us, to strengthen us, and to give us a vision, uh, especially when we find ourselves at a crossroad. Lord, I pray that Your will would be done You'd be among us. You'd bless this time over these next two days and the time to come. We thank you again and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you very much. Have a good evening.